Thank you for joining me for Home Worship. Today is March 6th, and the sermon title is The Global Uprising, A Path to Aliveness. This is a chapter out of a book we've been studying on Tuesday mornings and Tuesday nights in Bible study uh, throughout the year, this year, uh, starting last August in 21, and will be ending in August as well. The name of the book is We Make the Road by Walking by Brian McLaren, and it has been our guide serving to some degree as a lectionary, scriptures chosen by the author that I write sermons on, and sometimes I go in a different direction than, than how the author has uh, put the chapter together. And then we discuss in Bible study, and I learn and glean some of the things from the other thinkers that sit around the table, the other believers, the other uh, Bible learners that are on the path with me. It just so happens that what's going on in our world today, the invasion in Ukraine, directly reflects some of the things that happen in this chapter. This is a chapter on the third way, on Jesus and nonviolent responses and our struggles with them. We also invite you, if you're watching this early enough, to join us for a conversation about the crisis, the invasion, the war in Ukraine, with our own Reverend Dr. Paul Moises, who's a professor at Rosemont College in Philadelphia and a winter resident. And he originates, he and his wife Elizabeth, from the former Yugoslavia. And they have a lot to share with us about what is going on currently in Ukraine and also reflect theologically on Jesus and Jesus' response to aggression and his nonviolent way. So in this chapter for this week, this Jesus and the Third Way, is very applicable to the conversations we're having that Christians and people following Jesus all over the globe, especially in Western Europe, are thinking about and talking about today. A global uprising is the new section that we're in, and this chapter is A New Path to Aliveness. The scripture lesson that I'll be looking at is a big chunk of scripture. It's from Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through to 48. So it says this, Don't even begin to think that I have come to do away with the law and the prophets. I haven't come to do away with them, but to fulfill them. Jesus says this, I say to you very seriously that as long as heaven and earth exist, neither the smallest letter nor even the smallest stroke of a pen will be erased from the law until everything there becomes reality. Therefore, whoever ignores one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called the lowest in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps these commands and teaches people to keep them will be called the great in the kingdom of heaven. I say to you that unless your righteousness is greater than the righteousness of the legal experts and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard it said, To those who lived long ago, don't commit murder, and all who commit murder will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with their brother or sister will be in danger of judgment. If they say to their brother or sister, you idiot, they will be in danger of being condemned by the governing council. And if they say, you fool, they will be in danger of fiery hell. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, And there remember that your brother or sister has something against you. Leave your gift at the altar and go. First, make things right with your brother or sister and then come back and offer your gift. Be sure to make friends quickly with your opponents while you are with them on the way to court. Otherwise, they will haul you before the judge. The judge will turn you over to the officer of the court and you'll be thrown into prison. I say to you in all seriousness that you won't get out of there until you've paid the very last penny. You have heard it said, don't commit adultery. But I say to you that every man who looks lustfully at a woman has already committed adultery in his heart. And if your eye causes you to fall into sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better that you lose a part of your body than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to fall into sin, chop it off and throw it away. It's better that you lose a part of your body than that your whole body go into hell. It was said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a divorce certificate. 
But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife except for sexual unfaithfulness forces her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard it said to those who lived long ago, don't make a false solemn pledge. But you should follow through with what you have pledged to the Lord. But I say to you that you must not pledge at all. You must not pledge by heaven because it's God's throne. You must not pledge by earth because it's God's footstool. You must not pledge by Jerusalem because it's the city of the great king. And you must not pledge by your head because you can't turn one white hair or black. Let your yes mean yes and your no mean no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you that you must not oppose those who want to hurt you. If people slap you on your right cheek, you must turn the left cheek to them as well. When they wish to haul you into court and take your shirt, let them have your coat too. When they force you to go one mile, go with them too. Give to those who ask. Don't refuse those who wish to borrow from you. You have heard it's that it was said, you must love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who harass you so that you will be acting as children of your father who is in heaven, who makes the sun to rise on both the evil and the good and sends the rain on both the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love only those who love you, what reward do you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brother and sisters, what more are you doing? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, just as your heavenly Father is complete in showing love to everyone, so also you must be complete. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Now, I don't know about you, but I personally have had a tough time coming to terms with the application of tradition in the church. For the life of a Jesus follower, tradition exists, but doesn't dictate life, as it so often does in our church today. Jesus was going back and expanding upon tradition. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, taught that we should inform our lives of faith with scripture. Building on that, he thought that we should look at scripture through the multiple lenses of reason, tradition, and experience. It's rare for us to get hung up on the first one, reason. The reason you couldn't eat shellfish in the Old Testament was because of refrigeration, or more accurately, lack thereof. So you see where it stands to reason that that law can be broken. Experience, though, can lead us down some different roads when we use it as a filter for reading scripture. If you find a passage or story in the Bible that rings true in your experience, then you will likely value that passage or story greater than the others. You may even give your story, the one you like, more authority in your own mind when you're reading scripture. We are all our own subjective interpreters of scripture when it comes to applying experience. Here's where the function of tradition comes in. We rely on tradition to temper our application of our own limited experience when talking about God. In the passage I just read, Jesus builds on tradition. He starts with what would have been said of old and then expands upon it. He builds on it to the degree that it becomes something new and changes some of the meanings and definitely all the way these traditions are practiced. You have heard it said that it was to those who lived long ago, don't commit murder. And all who commit murder will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you, Jesus says, that everyone who is angry with their brother or sister will be in danger of judgment. You see, it's bad to murder, but the anger in your heart is also a sin, and Jesus is saying that. He's backing it up. 
it's the intention of murder. Where does murder come from? It comes from conflict. It comes from not seeing eye to eye. And he's saying that what we need to do is take this law and interpret it greater. Sometimes you call it the spirit of the law. The law not to murder means don't harm your brother or sister at all, physically. And Jesus expands it to say, don't harbor anything against your brother or sister at all, mentally, emotionally, or spiritually. Be sure to make friends quickly with your opponents. This is just good advice. He says to do this while you are on the way with them to court. Otherwise, they'll haul you before the judge. The judge will turn you over to the officer of the court and you will be thrown into prison. You see, Jesus is trying to help us get along. And he's using the commandment not to murder and expanding upon it so that we will have familial love between human beings. Then he says, you have heard it said, don't commit adultery. But I say to you that every man who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in his heart. You see, it's the same concept from murder. He's dialing it back and saying the, co the concept started in the heart of the person and it grew out into action. And if it didn't grow into action, it's still a sin. Jesus comes to reinforce this with eye plucking and hand chopping. You shall not lust in your heart after someone. And then he says, it was said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a divorce certificate. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife, for one exception, sexual unfaithfulness, forces her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now here, it's a little less clear what Jesus says, and we get hung up on this a lot. Ask any Roman Catholic who is divorced and remarried. It's a very difficult thing because Jesus was teaching about this here. The intention of the teaching is to keep marriages together, is to keep holy the things that you promise to one another. And later on in this set of edicts, Jesus is going to talk about oath keeping and how important it is to make your yes seem yes and your no mean no. And so when you marry, you have to be honest about it before it happens so that you don't end up with divorce. And I think that's the intention he's looking at more there, to keep marriages together. Not necessarily to punish people who end up in a divorce, but to keep marriages whole and wholesome. And then he goes into this next one, the one that relates to marriage and divorce. You've heard it said long ago, don't make a false solemn pledge, but you should follow through on what you have pledged to the Lord. But I say to you, and this is Jesus expounding upon the tradition, you must not pledge at all. You must not pledge by heaven. You must not pledge by earth. You, not, you must not pledge by the hair on your head or Jerusalem. See, Jesus is expanding on this idea that people were taking oaths and they weren't being completely honest with it. And it was breaking down the society and the systems that they set up. So the pledges don't really, really work. He says, in everything, in all dealings, let your yes mean yes and your no mean no. Basically, try to be the most honest person you can in everything. Not just the official things or the things you want to swear on some document or your mother's grave or your hair on your head or something like that. Don't do that. Always be a person who's consistent, whose word is their bond. That's important to Jesus. He also says this, if you've heard it said, the knife for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And this one is the most difficult for most of us, I think. He says, but I say to you, you must not oppose those who want to hurt you. If people slap you on your right cheek, you must turn and offer them the left cheek. When they wish to haul you to court and take your shirt, let them have your coat too. When they force you to go one mile, Go with them too. Now, this little vignette of three things, the slapping of cheeks, the suing for coats, and then going a mile. 
It was a common thing that would happen to people back in those days. Now, he was saying, when someone slaps you, stand up to them. Be strong, not reactive. Be strong, not reactive. Don't react and give in to the person that is harming you, that is being less human than they possibly could. Be the bigger person here. Stand up and offer them the other cheek. And then the next one, very confusing. And this is a little scandalous, but it's just how things were back then. Your undershirt and your coat were the only two garments you had. Without them, you're completely nude. And so if someone wants to unfairly take something from you in court, in a court of law, an official place, then you embarrass them by going completely naked and show the folly of their ways. And that's a form of resistance to this kind of abuse of the law. The last thing is about going a mile, carrying the pack and going a mile. It was common for the Roman occupying soldiers to be able to do that to the common people of the area, to say to them, I'm going on that you carry my pack for a mile, but they could only do it for a mile. They couldn't do it for two. And so as a resistance to that, the person would carry the pack the second mile, resisting the idea that they could be forced into this kind of indentured servitude for a mile of walking. So Jesus wants you to respond to aggression, not with the same equal aggression as in an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Jesus would have us respond in a different way, a third way, not reacting and giving back what we've gotten as in an eye for an eye and not being scared and shirking away. A third way between reacting and not responding at all is doing something different, controlling the narrative and pushing into a different direction. Jesus didn't want us to respond to violence with violence. Jesus taught a third way. It protects the bodies and the livelihoods of the innocent. Jesus would have us choose that path for our lives. He says also, give to those who ask and don't refuse those who wish to borrow from you. You have heard it said that you must love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who harass you so that you will be acting as children of your father who is in heaven. Where is it that we have something that we do now that is based on tradition, but it's modified by its fulfillment? Here, Jesus upsets the status quo. He changes the way they're thinking about what they've taken for granted, the teachings of their religion and their culture. He's meddling even with the religious types. Jesus is telling them to discern and fulfill the highest intention of tradition. He's breaking with tradition, but he's also building upon tradition. He's not saying, I'm throwing out the law. And in the beginning of what I read, indeed, he says, not one letter, not one pen stroke will be erased. But I have come, Jesus says, to fulfill the law. And so Jesus' fulfillment of the law takes us on a journey, a new journey, a journey to choose to respond to things done against us in a different way. Kill them with kindness. Stand up for yourself. You don't stoop to the same level as the person who is harming you. Don't join in the evil. Surprise the persecutor by loving them. Loving them away, if needs be. Loving them down to the core. 
If you think about it in most of our interpersonal relationships, the conflict that we have with a lot of folks comes out of our own insecurities, the way we were raised perhaps, things that are missing in our life that make it so that we would be aggressors towards one another. If we could have the posture of Jesus, we could begin to understand that people aren't whole, they're broken. And their brokenness leads into more brokenness. Hurt people hurt people. We need to be healing, healing of the world. And so if we took that posture and we understood where that was coming from, if we listened to this big part of scripture, Matthew chapter five, we would understand that that's how we respond, not react. And that's how we grow in faith. It's not an easy path to walk. It's simple. The principles are applied here. Simply be honest. Stand up for yourself, but don't react. Don't join in their game. It's simple. And yet, you know, it's very, very difficult. We always want to react. We want ourselves to be justified. We want to be strong. We want to be seen as the protector of the weak. So how do we choose this third way? Especially when we turn on the news every night and there's evil going on in the world and also in our interpersonal relationships where folks aren't getting along. How do we choose that third way? How do we pray for our enemies? How do we turn the other cheek and let someone slap us again? By standing up instead of falling down, by growing in faith and walking the extra mile, by letting people have things that they want from us. And mainly that thing is love. Giving people the benefit of the doubt and maybe even going a step further to love those who persecute you in that they might become less of persecutors. It's not easy, like I said, but it's simple. It's the path that we walk together following Jesus. I would encourage as we have more conversations for us to apply this third way to our life, to our public life, to our public policies in our nation, and to the way we see how violence plays out in our world. Restorative justice is the justice of God. It's the justice of Jesus. It's what we have seen. Because Jesus was the one who came out of the empty tomb. Without his resurrection, there is really no reason for nonviolent conflict resolution. And because of his resurrection, there is every reason for nonviolent conflict resolution. Because we believe that God has the power to lead us in the third way. Amen.